Hello, everybody. Welcome to Europe since COVID-19. Uh, this is a university uh, study group that is co-organized by Hope Harrison in history, Catherine Kleppinger in French studies, and me, uh, Hilary Silver, professor of sociology, international affairs, and public policy at George Washington University. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with our university seminar on uh, Europe since COVID, you can find information and recordings of all of our previous events on our new webpage, which I've just put into the chat. So you can catch up if you want to hear about previous events. Um, before I get started, I also want to call attention to our two next events so that you can put them in your calendar. One is we'll, our next event will be on March 24th at 10 a.m. on new directions for France and the Mediterranean uh, with Ambassador, sorry, with Ambassador Karim Amalal and Catherine Kleppinger will be the host for that. And uh, after that, we're going to have an event with, um, on, uh, on April 23rd at 10 a.m. on approaches to migration in Southern and Eastern Europe with attention to um, reception uh, conditions in Hungary, which you've probably heard about, we're not particularly welcoming, as well as uh, Greece, um, which, uh, as you know, had uh, recently had some uh, terrible conditions on the island of Lesbos. So we're going to be talking about those regions in particular uh, with Professor Anna Triandafaludu, who is the, <laughs> sorry to pronounce that, Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University and the editor of the Journal of Immigrant and Refugee Studies. And uh, with Andras Kovats, who's a migration expert and direct, director of the Budapest-based NGO called Menedek. And he's an assistant a research fellow at the Institute of Minority Studies at the Center for Social Sciences in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So please put those in your, in your date book. Again, March 24th at 10 and April 23rd at 10. Uh, today, I just want to say, uh, just logistically, if you have questions for today, please put them in the chat. And um, today's agenda, to get started, uh, will be looking at attitudes of Europeans towards immigrants and immigration since COVID-19. So it's been a year, believe it or not, it's been a year since the lockdowns began, over two 5 million people have died from coronavirus, half a million in the United States alone. Increasing border restrictions have had an impact on the mobility of migrants and the role of humanitarian organizations. Migration flows to the OECD countries with new permits are estimated to have fallen by 46% just in the first semester of 2020 and it's expected to have uh, to be an historic low for migration to OECD countries. The estimates for 2020 suggest the population of Germany didn't grow for the first time in the last decade because of the decline in immigration. The International Organization for Migration reports that migrants, particularly those in lower paid jobs, may be both more affected by and vulnerable to the spread of COVID but migrants may also play an important role in responding to COVID-19 by working in critical sectors. The pandemics also prevented many refugees from resettling. Nearly one and a half million refugees were in urgent need of resettlement through the UN last year, but just 22,000 had the chance to actually come, to actually move. Restrictions on international travel have meant that those people who have waited for years for asylum requests to be granted had to wait for months more for the national borders to reopen. So last year, I saw the lowest number of refugees resettled since 2003. And as you know, the Trump administration capped refugee admittances. 
The EU as a whole registered a 33% year-on-year decrease in asylum applications and a six-year low in irregular border crossings, in part because of the COVID-19 restrictions that countries put in place. These are all statistics, but, you know, the world seemed to settle into this socially distanced new normal without any travel. And just as we were sort of living with our, you know, being locked down in our countries and localities, the vaccines have arrived. And so this suggests that institutions and borders are about to open up. Latin American arrivals at the Mexican border are already starting to increase. And as our last event discussed, the European Commission presented a new pact on migration and asylum in September in an attempt to reach a consensus on the shared obligations of nation states to contribute to border patrol and reception of new migrants. So, all of this makes it a good time to assess what the pandemic has meant for millions of migrants and refugees seeking asylum in Europe and for Europeans and Americans who might receive them. Polls like Eurobarometers are indicating that immigration is sort of falling off of the, uh, uh, the agenda uh, with the worsening economic situation due to COVID-19 replacing them. And as immigration takes a backseat to other issues, anti-immigrant sentiments associated with voting for the far right may have important implications for upcoming elections in a number of key European countries. So this seminar is going to feature two experts in public opinion who will examine European attitudes towards immigrants in light of the pandemic. Andrew Geddes is a professor of migration studies and director of the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute. Before he joined e EU EUI, he was professor of politics at the University of Sheffield, where he was the head of department from 2008 to 2011. He's published extensively on global migration with a particular focus on policy making and the politics of migration and regional cooperation and integration. His forthcoming book, you should all know it's supposed to be out hot off the press, Governing Migration Beyond the State, Europe, North America, South America, and Southeast Asia in a Global Context, is about to appear this month with Oxford University Press. On Europe, his other publications include The Politics of Migration and Immigration in Europe, uh, with Sage and A Rising Tide, The Salience of Immigration and the Rise of Anti-Immigration Political Parties in Western Europe. Christopher Warshaw is going to be the commentator on Dr. Getty's presentation. He's Associate Professor of Political Science at George Washington University and he previously taught at MIT and holds a PhD and a JD from Stanford. Dr. Warshaw's research evaluates the links between public opinion elections and political outcomes, primarily in the United States, but he's recently published an article that included Europe. And his work has been published in top journals like the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Politics, the British Journal of Political Science and other top journals. So without any further introduction, I'd like to hand over the mic or the Zoom room to Andrew Geddes. Uh, thank you, Hilary. I suppose the traditional start to a webinar is to ask if people can hear me, which I'm hoping you can. Uh, well, thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's great to be with you, if only virtually. Uh, we. Uh, still one year later entering a new the third wave in Italy of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic so still a lot of restrictions and the vaccination programs really yet to kick in but optimistic that uh, things are going to get better for the next couple of months. I'm uh, at EUI as Hilary said I direct the Migration Policy Centre we work across all aspects of migration so the, the factors that shape migration the factors that shape responses to migration and we think about that globally. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about something a little more specific, which is uh, public attitudes to migration in Europe. Uh, and I will put up the slide now. So that's what I'm going to talk about, COVID-19 and attitudes to immigration in Europe. So it's looking at one particular uh, 
set of issues, but I think really quite important, as Hillary was pointing out, uh, there has been increase in support for radical right anti-immigration political parties across the EU. Uh, immigrants and, uh, well, in, in the, the situation of migrant workers, but also people stuck in camps or stuck on the borders of Europe has worsened as a result of the pandemic. So there are, are many issues that are associated with political debate about immigration in Europe. But what I want to do is, is think about the impact of COVID-19 and to give you a sense of what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to argue that the pandemic is unlikely to lead to worsening attitudes to migration in Europe. And why I'm going to argue that is that actually, if you look at over time, attitudes towards migration across Europe have become more favourable over time, including after the refugee crisis. So I'm going to draw from some data which tries to show some evidence about long-term trends in attitudes to migration in Europe. Uh, and in particular, what I'd argue, increased favourability um, in, uh, across the European Union. This isn't to say that there's some kind of tidal wave of pro-migration sentiment in the EU. Attitudes have become more favourable, or perhaps you could say less unfavourable, but across the European Union. Uh, and of course, well, the obvious thing then is to say, well, if that's happening, if attitudes to migration are becoming more favourable, then why did we see a big increase in support for anti-immigration political parties, particularly after 2015 and the uh, so-called refugee crisis? Well, I think what I'm, what I'm going to try and explain today is that high issue salience, uh, sort of public attention to the immigration issue, explains the success of the of radical right immigration, anti, anti immigration political parties. Uh, but issue salience was already declining before the pandemic and has continued to decline since then. So I don't think the pandemic is necessarily likely to lead to a worsening of attitudes, but uh, just to be clear about what I'm saying and what I am not saying. I am not saying, as I said, there's a wave of pro-migration sentiment sweeping across the EU. It's much more complicated than that. Or, uh, I'm, well, I'm also not saying that the underlying policy issues and governance issues are not challenging. They certainly are, and perhaps even more so as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so but, so I'm, what I'm going to do then is focus on the specific aspect of the debate, but I think it is of, of some importance uh, and also quite interesting in, in what I think it says about uh, attitudes to migration generally in Europe, but also the factors that can drive support for radical right political parties that uh, make strong appeals on the basis of anti-immigration sentiment and opposition to immigration. So what, what I wanted to do to start with, which is step back a little bit, because uh, if we're going to look at attitudes to migration, it can be quite helpful to think about the factors that drive attitudes to migration. And what we've done at the, in this, uh, the centre that I direct, the Migration Policy Centre, is create something called the Observatory of Public Attitudes to Migration. So if anybody was interested, you can go to our website, uh, the Migration Policy Centre, which is basically Migration Policy Centre, all as one word, .eu. Uh, and you can find our observatory of public attitudes to migration, where we try to gather data and material on attitudes to migration across, across Europe, but also looking beyond Europe. What we also did was develop what we call this funnel of causality, try to understand the factors that play a role in shaping attitudes to immigration. So if you look at this funnel, as we call it, on the left-hand side, you see factors which we identify as having distal effects. They are strong and stable. Uh, in relation to values, personality type, moral foundations, but also early life norm acquisition, educational experience and lifestyle. And moving to the right, as you look at it, fact, uh, more immediate proximal effects, which are weaker and less stable, which uh, can also affect attitudes. But what we are trying to demonstrate in this, what we call this funnel of causality, is the importance of these, these distal effects, which are strong, stable, and are likely to be relatively resistant to change. Whereas more proximal effects, such as media coverage, we would argue, are more likely to play a role in activating existing sentiments towards migration, which are more deeply grounded in uh, values and early life experiences, particularly of education 
So I think that's one of the, I suppose, a kind of key takeaway that we try and get across in our work on public attitudes to migration is this point that attitudes are likely to be relatively stable, perhaps like, but also resistant to change and very powerfully influenced by early life experiences, particularly of education. Uh, and so having just briefly looked at that, what I wanted to do now was put forth some evidence which looks at attitudes to migration across Europe and to try and show how they've actually become more stable, more favorable, not less favorable over time. Now, the next chart, I'm afraid, is probably a bit of a test for the eyesight. So I'm going to talk, talk you through it. It's looking at data from 27 EU member states. Uh, and what we do is, well, if we, what you can see there is, well, through from Austria to Slovenia, it's data from the Eurobarometer survey. And it's looking at the period 2014 to 2019. And what it's trying to understand is net positivity to migration from within the EU. So that's basically free movement by EU citizens, which is the dark line in each of these charts. And net positivity to migration from outside the EU, which is by what the EU would label as third country nationals, but non-EU citizens, which of course I am now one as a UK citizen. Uh, for most of the time, but when this data was gathered, I was an EU citizen. But obviously, the effect of Brexit is I'm no longer an EU citizen. But just to be clear, the dark line on each chart is attitudes to uh, uh, free movement, migration inside the EU, and the lighter line on each chart is attitudes to migration from outside the EU by non-EU citizens. So if you look at the visa, this is for 27 EU member states, Cyprus is not included, but we don't think that's crucial. Uh, and so if you, if you look, at, if I try and summarise this for you, there has been a consistent and considerable increase in positivity towards both migration from inside the EU and from outside the EU since 2014. This is significant because, of course, the so-called refugee crisis was 2015, when more than a million people entered Europe, uh, many through Greece, and of course, many, many moved on to Germany. Uh, so they're kind of familiar with the story that we're familiar with that began in 2015. So this data is looking at the period 2014 to 2019. And what we see is a considerable increase in positivity, both towards EU free movement and also migration from outside the EU in each member, each member state since 2014. Uh, what, we, what, what this chart shows is that positivity is increasing across Europe to migration or at least negativity is falling. You've got different levels on, on the charts and so there is some variation, for instance, for Central and Eastern Europe. But similar kind of trends if we look across the 27 countries. Uh, so if you look at Germany, which is in the second column on the left-hand side, so Germany received... Uh, nearly 900,000 asylum applicants in 2015, but you can see that there was a, an increase in positivity to migration from outside the EU between 2014 and 2019, and also an increase in positivity to migration within the e from within the EU for a, a free move movement. Now, we can, you can go back and look further than this as well using Eurobarometer data, but also data from European Social Survey over the last 20 years or so and see similar trends, which we would argue are linked to generational change in Europe. In particular, expanded access to higher education, the effects of that on attitudes, which is, I think, is, is quite significant in the European context. And I think it confounds uh, the, some of the perspectives which sometimes represented in uh, some media coverage of migration, that there, are, there is a, a kind of a rising tide of anti-immigration sentiment. At the, at the beginning of this talk, Hillary mentioned an article I co-authored, which was basically entitled a, 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 a rising tide, question mark, uh, look at, uh, and we, uh, which was published in Political Quarterly a couple of years ago. And we challenged this idea that there's a rising tide of anti-immigration sentiment in Europe. But what we also did in this article was show in a lot of the speeches by European political leaders or in a lot of the media coverage of migration, it's kind of taken for granted that there is a rising tide of anti-immigration sentiment, that people in Europe are becoming more negative towards uh, migration. Uh, now, that's not borne out by the data. It doesn't seem, it's not supported, but... Uh, of course, it then raises the question of 
this, this, the next issue will, will then would explain the rise of radical right anti-immigration political parties. And so on this slide, I've kind of shown four of the perhaps the best examples of that. In the top left hand corner, you've got the leader of the number one political party in Italy at the moment, Matteo Salvini. He leads a party called the Lega, used to be called the Lega Nord. They are the uh, lead, they are the leading party on the right in Italy, which seems uh, very strong favourites to win the next elections in Italy, uh, and Salvini is a leader of that party. Uh, the Lega campaigned extremely strongly on immigration issues, and Salvini was interior minister in Italy for a period of a year between 2018 and 2019. Next to him, on the top right, you've got Nigel Farage, who is a leader of UKIP in the UK, the UK Independence Party. He never secured a seat in Parliament. He tried seven times to get into Parliament in the UK, was defeated each time. But of course, his main success was the vote in June 2016 for the UK to leave the EU, uh, and which was a vote strongly driven by concern about migration. So the, vote, the Brexit vote in the UK was strongly driven by uh, concern about migration and the salience of migration is an issue amongst leave voters and this was a particularly notorious campaign poster breaking point showing people I think it might be well it was in I think it might be in Slovenia so not people in the UK but obviously evoking all kinds of fears of uh, migration uh, and kind of the, 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 that poster was uh, became one of the kind of defining images of the Brexit campaign in the UK and Farage was one of the kind of uh, figures most strongly associated with that. In the bottom left hand corner, of course, you've got Marine Le Pen, leader of the French, uh, well, they uh, re renamed themselves, no longer the Front National, uh, but again, you know, likely to be a contender for the French presidency next year. And in the bottom right, you've got Gert Wilders, and I took this photo is of him having a cigarette and a nice chat with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte which I chose this picture because I think uh, perhaps it also shows the extent to which at times the radical or extreme right are co-opted or, or their ideas are co-opted by mainstream right-wing parties. Ruter is the leader of uh, mainstream right parties in the Netherlands, uh, but I think there is evidence from across the EU of the co-option of radical extreme right ideas on immigration into governing coalitions of more mainstream centre-right political parties and for those who are interested, I've just co-edited a special issue of a journal called the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, which look, looks at centre-right political parties and migration and looks at the, the way in which uh, radical right ideas have been co-opted by mainstream right parties. But the basic question is, well, what explains the rise of these radical right anti-immigration political parties if attitudes to migration in Europe are becoming more favourable? Well, the answer is to that, I think, is that uh, the support for these parties is specific, not general, and is particularly influenced by issue salience. So in this chart, what, what we're doing here, what, we try, what I try to do here is uh, look at, the, try to look at the, the vote for populist radical right political parties in uh, 12 European countries, that is the blue line, and the number of people saying immigration is the most important political issue, which is the orange line. So we've got uh, 12 European countries here. And what we did, we took a measure of issue salience from Eurobarometer, because the, since 2005, Eurobarometer has asked around 1,000 respondents in each EU member state about the two most important political issues affecting their country. And we take the percentage responding immigration uh, and we show that as the orange line in, in the chart. What we also did was take measures of national level support for the leading uh, anti-immigration political party in each of these countries in publicly available opinion polls. Uh, and what we show in this chart is a, is a, a correlation between Percentage listing immigration is one of the two most important issues affecting one, uh, one's country and a percentage voting for anti-immigration political parties between 2015 and, uh, sorry, 2005 and 2018. And the correlation is in uh, what we would see as expected direction, that uh, concern about immigration correlates quite strongly with support for uh, radical right anti-immigration political parties. 
it, the correlation is in the expected direction in all cases except for Finland. And I'm not enough of an expert on Finland to know precisely why that might be the case. What we also did was add the correlation support for anti-immigration right in the sense of immigration in Portugal and Spain, where you see that uh, the effect of that very kind of uh, almost kind of the absence of uh, uh, vote for the populist right. Although I would say that in both those countries, Portugal and Spain, since we did this analysis, there has been uh, an upturn in support for, well, in, in, in Spain, the Vox party, and also in Portugal. So uh, people have begun to think that what was seen as Iberian exceptionalism in relation to this trend of support for radical right parties may have been broken because of recent developments in Portugal and Spain. Uh, we also include Ireland, and in Ireland there is no uh, anti-immigration political party. So Ireland is also included where uh, there, no political party has emerged, which is uh, campaigning on immigration, um, campaigning on immigration issues. So this brings me to this, the question I wanted to ask from the start, what effect will a pandemic have on attitudes to migration? And there are, I mean, I'm, as I said at the start, I'm, I just want to think about one aspect of this because as Hillary said, there are so many ways we could think about this issue, and there are so many policy and governance dilemmas that are raised by it. I only know from my own, my own experience where I live in the centre of Florence, one of the things that was most noticeable during the pandemic, when we were in, were in during the first lockdown, when we were really strictly locked down here in Italy, was the visibility of migrant workers. So uh, I don't know what it's like in the US, I guess it's similar, but the people delivering food. So here on bikes and on uh, motorbikes, driving around the city, large numbers of migra migrants heavily involved in, in that kind of food delivery, heavily involved also in the provision of healthcare, both in public facilities, but also very importantly in the home because of the structure of the Italian welfare state, there's a strong reliance on provision of care in the home for the elderly. So migration became more visible, clearly more visible. Now, what effects that will have on attitudes to migration? I think we're going. We're, we will, those things will play out in the future. You know, it's, these, these are complex issues because at the same time as the visibility of migrants, we also have the appalling conditions that Hillary identified for migrants held in in terrible conditions in camps in Greece or absolutely appalling conditions on the borders of Europe in countries like Bosnia or even worse in camps in Libya. So there's there are many aspects of this debate about uh, attitudes to migration and migration governance and policy in the future that affect the member states of the European Union and also affect the European Union itself because the European Union has competences in the area of migration and asylum policy. So I'm, I'm cutting into this in, in, a, in, a, in a way which uh, I think has implications for debate in the future about because what I would uh, suggest is that migration uh, is likely to be considerably less salient as a political issue. Uh, that doesn't mean issues are not important. I think as I've already said, I would emphasize again, a decline in issue salience means that other issues such as obviously economic reconstruction and healthcare are necessarily taking priority. Migration and the rights of migrants are are part of those debates but aren't the direct focus of them and I think across Europe some of the heat has been taken out of the immigration issue and so I've got another one of those uh, eyeball testing charts for you here where we've kind of we've, we've we've got looking again across the European Union and what we're doing here is looking at the, the European the portion of Europeans naming health social security immigration unemployment as one of the two most important issues affecting their country between 2005 and 2019. And I'll, I'll try and talk you through some of the headlines here that uh, what, what we see here is that in Northwest Europe, uh, with the exception of Ireland and France, immigration reached a high peak of salience around the time of the uh, crisis in 2015, 2016, the refugee crisis. And it's only partially declined since. In Southern Europe, as well as in France and Ireland, immigration was entirely, either entirely overshadowed by the salience of unemployment, uh, as in Portugal in the case of 
Greece, Italy, and Spain emerged later. So in, the, in Central and Eastern Europe, there was a notable increase in the salience of immigration in, in 2015, albeit smaller than in Northwest Europe and, 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 and declining since. Uh, and what we would see from this is that the, the relationship between the salience of unemployment and immigration is, is negative. So should unemployment increase, we can expect the salience of immigration to fall. Uh, and notably, in almost every member state of the European Union prior to the pandemic, uh, health and social security had, had increased in salience. Now, since the COVID-19 pandemic, so referring to more recent opinion data, so since the since COVID-19 pandemic began, not included in these charge, but looking at some of the more recent polling data, what we can see is that the salience of immigration has fallen rapidly has been replaced by health concerns, which is hardly unexpected. Uh, also, as Hillary said, immigration rates are likely to remain lower than they were prior to the pandemic. Uh, and I would argue that immigration rates and do contribute to the salience of the immigration issue. Uh, so all that being said, the pandemic and responses to it mean that economic and welfare issues are very likely to dominate the political agenda in Europe for years to come. So, and this is where I think, and moving on to a next point, which I think is very interesting in terms of the politics of this. So even if governing parties are discredited on the issues of health or economics, it could be argued there's little reason to think that they will turn first to the radical right on those issues to pick up the pieces. Now, the issue here is whether radical right parties, which campaigned and made and kind of effectively in many countries owned the immigration issue, can change tack, can change direction, and begin to make credible claims around health, welfare, and economics. So their future is likely to be highly contingent, these radical right parties, which were strongly identified by their focus on immigration and anti-immigration. Uh, positions, whether, so how long the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic will dominate politics, but also how this will affect their strategies. So just as one illustration of that, in Italy, uh, for those who, who follow debate here, uh, there's a new government, which in itself is not a surprise, uh, but the government is led by a, a man called Mario Draghi, who was the president of the European Central Bank and was appointed by the president as prime minister to replace the uh, previous prime minister because of a governmental crisis. And Draghi is almost the archetypal technocrat, uh, former president of the European Central Bank, as I said. Now, the interesting thing is that the Lega Nord, which previously was seen as of the Lega, the, anti the radical right party, which was previously deeply opposed to all the things that Draghi represents in terms of technocracy, the Euro, the European Central Bank, actually is offering full support to his government and is participating in it. Uh, and the leader of the Lega, Matteo Salvini, is now a convert, apparently, to pro-Europeanism. Uh, so Salvini previously used to campaign with the slogan, Slaves of Europe, and in the space of about 24 hours with the formation of a Draghi government, Salvini apparently became pro-EU. So we see how long that lasts for, but he made it clear that he would support the Draghi government and that Italy's interests were European interests. Now, I would suggest that there are, well, one of the reasons for that is that the Draghi government and the participation of the Lega in it strongly legitimizes the Lega. If you wanted a strategy to legitimize a party that was seen as an outsider uh, and as having major credibility problems outside of Italy, then participating in a government led by highly credible international figures such as Draghi could be a way to, uh, add, to legitimate the Lega. Uh, and it is the leading Italian political party. And if the opinion polls are, uh, are, are uh, are, are maintained, their opinion poll position is maintained, they are very likely to be um, forming a government after the next general election here in Italy because the right have been consistently heading the opinion polls for a considerable period of time here in Italy. What Salvini is also doing for those you know, uh, is 
positioning himself very strongly around vaccination and healthcare issues, almost running his own foreign policy, contacting foreign governments about vaccination and access to vaccines. Now, I think this is interesting because the, the Lega rose to prominence almost in, entirely because of their campaigning on immigration. Uh, Salvini has now ditched effectively talk about immigration. It's still there in the background, but he is trying to reposition the party, but also, I think, to legitimate the party uh, through its participation in this new government. So that's one story from one European country, and it's obviously one I know quite well because it's one I live in, uh, but there are stories that could be you know, told about many other European countries where radical right parties are, uh, in, in the face of declining sales of immigration, need to work out their response to the pandemic. And obviously there are impending elections in the Netherlands too, uh, and in many of the European countries. So to wrap up, uh, thinking about this issue of uh, the pandemic and attitudes to immigration in Europe, well, I think it's important to bear in mind that attitudes to migration in Europe have become more, not less favourable over time. Uh, if you want to understand the rise of anti-immigration political parties, and I think that the high issue salience, particularly after 2015, plays an important role in that. Uh, I would suggest that COVID-19 is unlikely to affect these long-term trends, and it's also likely to mean reduced issue salience because other things will be more important. But this is not to say that this means that pro-migration sentiment sweeps across the EU. It's much more complicated than that. And also important policy and governance challenges will likely become even more pressing. And I've not gone in and spoken about them because of what I've been focusing on, but there are many issues around uh, migration policy and migration governance, which are likely to remain very important in the EU. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's great. And you, uh, thank you for putting up your, um, your email address and your Twitter handle so people can be in touch with you. That's terrific. Um, so now we'll hear from uh, Christopher Warshaw, who has, I'm sure, many insightful comments to make on your presentation. Chris? Thanks, Hillary, and thanks for inviting me to join this group. This was a terrific presentation and a terrific paper, and I really enjoyed uh, reading it. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you today about it. So let me share, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, can you guys see this? Yes. Terrific. Awesome. So, um, um, so once again, I'm Chris Warshaw. I teach in the political science department at GW and uh, most of my work focuses on American politics, but I've also recently done some work on public opinion in Europe. Um, so, and I'll, I'm gonna actually link to some of my own work as I go through today. Um, so just to briefly recap the paper and the presentation, um, I think the key takeaways for me is that immigration opinion is getting more liberal or more, more pro-immigrant, in other words, really across Europe. And, um, you know, this is a little bit counter, may, may, or not, may not be counterintuitive to you, but it's certainly counterintuitive probably for many folks that, you know, are just sort of following the, the news about immigration and it's um, in partly based on its increased salience, um, as the, the paper talked about. Um, so I thought the evidence there was interesting and pretty compelling. Um, so the authors argue, so they think where the, where the paper gets a little bit, um, I think an important argument of the paper, which wasn't, didn't have quite as strong evidence for, is that the um, liberal trend in immigration opinion is likely to continue in the future, thus potentially rendering immig immigration politics um, less important or, or maybe, maybe important, but in a more liberal direction um, in the future. Despite the general liberal trends, the paper noted that immigration um, seems to have helped right-wing parties in recent years due to its increased salience. Um, and we talked in the, during the presentation, he talked about a couple examples of that. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the analogies and from American politics, or this looks sounds similar to gun control, which has overwhelmingly liberal majorities. You know, most people in the United States favor gun control, but it seems like when the salience of gun control and guns kind of, kind of rises, it actually helps right-wing parties. Possibly, possibly because the people that really care about gun control are actually conservative. And you might, and you didn't you frame this quite so explicitly like this, but it might be that's sort of the case here. So like lots of people have vaguely liberal views on immigration, but they don't really care that much about it. But maybe the people that like really care about it are actually anti-immigration. Um, 
And, you know, that, that sort of sounds a lot like what we see with, in the U.S. with gun control and, and maybe with immigration, too, where I think there's a lot of evidence that just like in Europe, immigration attitudes have trended to the left in the United States over the past, um, certainly the last half decade or decade. Um, you know, like an example of that, for instance, is the Democratic Party, you know, the left wing party in the U.S. was on board for reforms that would have made it harder to immigrate to the U.S. You know, the, one of the big compromise plans 10 years ago was like essentially a fence along the border which would be like totally anathema in liberal politics today, as the, certainly the Democratic Party and broadly the country has moved to the left in immigration. But despite that, it seems like the immigration salience really helped Donald Trump a little bit in the 2016 election. Um, and then finally, the paper argues that immigration is unlikely to stay salient in the next few years, largely due to the COVID crisis and the economic fallout of the COVID crisis. And again, I thought this was plausible but you know, I thought the evidence here is a little bit less clear to me. Um, so I'm gonna give, I'm gonna raise a couple of questions and suggestions, which partly apply, you know, this paper is more of a policy brief. So, you know, some of this might be relevant for this paper, but I think, you know, it's more relevant perhaps for the broader research agenda around the role of public attitudes toward immigration in Europe. So one is that, you know, the paper gives us the, the main evidence for the long-term trends in this paper is, um, you know, this graph that has uh, immigration attitudes broken down by country. And this graph breaks it down just from 2014 to 2019. So a couple of these minor points about this graph is I do think this graph, you know, I was on board mostly with this graph, you know, with the takeaways from this graph. But it is a little actually hard, even in the paper, you have to sort of squint at it and really like zoom in the screen to like see the trends. And you know they weren't crystal clear. Um, I also I kind of wanted to see a graph in the paper that summarized opinion across Europe, because a lot of the points in the paper were about well there isn't actually you know the, the paper argued like well most of these trends are pretty homogeneous across Europe, and there's this clear trend line. But actually those you know those weren't so clear in this graph because there's a lot of you know noise to signal in this graph was like not great. There's a lot of noise. Um, so I would I would have loved to see a graph that summarized opinion across Europe. And if you're gonna show a graph that breaks things down by country, I actually wanted the paper to engage more with the heterogeneity by country. You know, so is it really true that like trends in Hungary look like trends in Austria or and trends in Great Britain or France or whatever? Um, and you know, if you squint really hard at the graph, actually, you know, it looks like there is some heterogeneity across countries. Um, you know, Greece has sort of been flat on immigration while maybe um, other countries like Belgium are like getting more liberal. Um, I don't know. And an example, just to give you some example of my own work. So I've done a lot of work for a recent paper trying to summarize public opinion on immigration across Europe. And for that paper, we both tried to summarize um, both at the country level, but also across Europe. And we also gave provided longer term trends. And I thought this too was a, in, in this paper, I wanted to see a little bit more longer term trends. But this is kind of an example of how you could imagine summarizing public opinion across all of Europe. And it turns out if you zoom back 20 years instead of just five years, actually the liberal trend in public opinion emerges much more clearly. We really do see that over the long haul, um, Europe is really is moving to the left on immigration, you know, again, somewhat counterintuitively. Um, and another thing just to highlight is, you know, which isn't central to this paper's argument, but immigration attitudes actually look much more like other, look very similar to other cultural attitudes across Europe. So, you know, if you look at like abortion, same-sex marriage, attitudes toward religion, um, all of those sort of cultural attitudes are trending to the left over the long term. And, um, you know, I think people have, you could argue either way, whether immigration is sort of a separate issue domain or whether it fits in with these other cultural issues, but certainly over time, they have very similar long-term time trends. It's also worth noting on both of these issues that like the gradient across age groups looks very similar where younger people both are um, much more liberal than older people, but are also trending rapidly to the left. So another point in the paper was the, um, the, he the sort of homogeneity across country, but I just wanted to mention a graph from, from my own work, which I think does show a little more heterogeneity across countries. Where in this graph, which is oriented from the most, this graph only goes up to 2016, so it doesn't go quite as far as the, the current um, Andrews paper, but you know, it's, or, these, this graph is oriented from the most conservative country, Hungary, on immigration to the most liberal, which is sort of Sweden and the Netherlands. And, you know, across these countries, they are certainly trending to the left over time. 
But, um, you know, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity. It actually looks like Hungary has gotten more conservative in recent years, which I think Andrew mentioned maybe briefly in the, in the presentation or in the paper. Um, you know, the Czech Republic also looks like it's gotten a little more conservative. So it does look like there is some important heterogeneity that maybe we'd want to zoom in on um, and, and explore more. So another point the paper makes is, uh, 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 well, I'll come back to, well, I'll be able to mention this briefly. Another important point, by the way, about these graphs from some of, some of the work that, um, that I've done is they actually summarize public opinion across dozens of different survey items. And I think that, you know, one concern I had, which I'll mention, I'll talk more about later, is that, you know, the paper focuses entirely on, almost entirely on public opinion from the Eurobarometer. And it mentions, I think, in the paper that the European social survey shows slightly different trends. And, you know, I really wanted to know more about, like, how homogeneous are these, kind, are these trends across surveys. And so I think a latent variable model of some sort, and there's different approaches to doing that, where you aggregate across surveys might yield a cl more clearer picture that's more robust to individual surveys. So the next point the paper makes is on issue salience. And this is sort of the key piece of evidence in the paper where it shows you know, the percentage of the time that people mention these different uh, issues on the open, I think it's on the open ends on the, of the survey. And here too, I thought, you know, I was on board for the most part with, uh, with the takeaway. But it is a little tricky, like the evidence is not, it's, I, first of all, the graph's kind of hard to read. You know, I think ideally you'd show the, the evidence here a little <laughs> bit in a sort of crisper fashion. But I think secondarily, the, the trends actually don't look homogeneous to me across countries. You know, if you look at like Malta here in the middle, like it looks like immigration's both super important and like skyrocketing in salience. Um, so, you know, and that could just be noise in the survey, I don't know. But, um, you know, my takeaway from this was um, that it either actually don't look like there's like super homogeneous trends across, at least across all these countries. And maybe exploring that heterogeneity would be useful. Um, some other brief questions. So, um, you know, I mentioned a second ago evidence from other surveys and whether other surveys show similar patterns. So just to like briefly um, sort of expand upon that. So this was from some of the work that I've done uh, where I show sort of different survey items. So there's something like two or three dozen, maybe 25 or 30 survey items on immigration across different surveys. And not all of them continue to the, the present. Um, but, you know, I think for a paper like this, where you want to make sort of general claims about immigration in Europe and in, in public opinion in Europe, I think, I, you know, it would be really helpful to show um, evidence from a wider battery of surveys. Um, you know, some of these surveys and also, you know, the, the evidence, the survey items in the European barometer are a little bit wonky. Um, and it's, you know, first of all, there are only two of them. And second, it's like hard to know what to make of like the difference between immigrants from Europe, from Europe versus outside of Europe and sort of what, you know, what underlying, what, you know, to the extent there's differences in those attitudes, like what's driving it. So I think expanding beyond the European bar barometer to these other surveys um, would be really helpful. Um, so then... I also wanted to know more about the political implications. You talked about this briefly. Um, you know, one important point is like, how strong is the, is the link between immigration and the performance of right-wing parties? And there was a graph in the paper that sort of wanted us to visualize those correlations. Sorry, it wasn't in the paper, it was in the presentation. But I wanted to see more, um, you know, at the very least like regression-based evidence and just more discussion of like how strong really is this evidence for this link between immigration opinion and right-wing parties. Um, so I think that's important for thinking about sort of the takeaway implications of opinion here. Um, another point about the political implications, I think a lot of the takeaway and sort of, well, you know, this isn't going to be as important in the future and it you know, hinges on this idea that immigration salience is going to continue to decrease. And, you know, I wonder in the past, like how tight has been the relationship between issue salience for immigration and the economy um, or other crises. And I don't, I don't have a clear sense of that. Um, but I think that, I guess I'd want it to see be explored a little more systematically to really feel totally confident about that. Another important point, which the paper didn't talk about at length, but I think was, seems important to me thinking from the US context, is how, is immigration added, how are immigration attitudes sorting by, by party? So a different way of putting that are people that are right-wing on immigration increasingly supporting right-wing parties 
Um, and, it's, and how linked is that to issue salience? Um, I think that's an important thing to know more about. So, because for instance, like, you know, if, if attitudes and, part and partisanship are increasingly sorting themselves, so that people that are right-wing in immigration are also supporting right-wing parties, then that could have important sort of implications for polarization and possibilities for like legislative compromise and, you know, lots of other aspects of politics in Europe. And then finally, I wanted to know more, you know, beyond the, the, the implications for elections and polariza polarization, I wanted to know more about what you think about the implications of um, this leftward ship and, shift in public opinion on um, immigration policy, and I'm particularly on the number of migrants that we should expect in Europe and sort of restrictions on migration. And, um, oh, this isn't going to work. Um, Oops. Uh, let's see. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so this is where this is it on a different version of the presentation. So, in, in some of my work, I've looked at the relationship between, um, you know, immigration, public opinion, and and this migration integration policy index um, that's published by a I think by a nonprofit. And you know, we found a pretty robust, but not you know, totally solid correlation between the two. And I think this at least suggests the fact that as Europe gets more liberal on immigration policy um, attitudes that you also might expect to be to see a loosening of restrictions on, on immigration. But I think to see that explored more systematically would be great. And I think that's something that maybe in the paper I would suggest just sort of like nodding to that like, oh, this might have implications for policy as well. Um, so with that I'll, I'll stop and, um, and turn it back over to you. Thanks again for giving me the chance to read this paper. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Chris. That's great. I mean, first of all, everyone got a chance to hear about your findings, as well as uh, challenging uh, Andrew. And I just want to uh, encourage the listeners to put questions into the chat while Andrew gets a chance to respond to all of these wonderful questions <laughs> that Chris has posed. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, thank, thanks, Chris. As, uh... Really fantastic comments. Maybe I should also explain to the audience that what Chris saw was a paper that I was asked to do for the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, with a colleague of mine here. Uh, and you're absolutely right. They kind of said, well, can you tell us what you expect to see and do it in about two and a half thousand words? <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, there is other work around this. Where we, you know, so we've recently been doing a lot of work looking in Italy much more specifically at some of the issues you raised. And you're absolutely right about heterogene heterogeneity. So, yeah, those are important points. And in other work we've done, we certainly try to try to explore that in much more carefully. And we also do use other survey data and we try, and we're currently involved in projects where we're trying to bring that data together in exactly along the lines that you suggest. <coughs> so I can't, I maybe should I, you know, kind of, <coughs> Oh, excuse me, that's asthma, not COVID, don't worry. Um, but I, I just wanted to, the, the point I think, well, the point I wanted to focus on, which I think is a, is a really important one that Chris has made, is this, is liberal or left tendencies in attitudes to immigration in Europe. Because I think that's a really fantastic point, but I think it's also a really interesting point. Because what we've, uh, and, and I'm here I'm going to talk a little about, about other work that we've done, because I think that what actually, and also some data we've gathered ourselves, is looking at some of the trade-offs that are powerfully present in attitudes to migration. So if you're talking about liberal or left attitudes to migration, what would that mean? Would it be access to territory? Would it be access to rights? Uh, and is there some kind of trade-off between access to territory and access to rights so that people are prepared to accept as access to rights but maybe less enthusiastic about access to territory? Uh, and so what we did was we did a survey experiment across six European countries, or colleagues of mine here did that survey experiment in six European countries. And what they found was that, uh, uh, that respondents to the survey in those countries were supportive of the rights of migrants of the rights to family, to be joined by family members, of the right to work, but we're also uh, quite keen to see quotas and limits on access. So I think this is a really good point that Chris makes. So I'm not, I wouldn't see the attitudes that I've identified in, I would say this very broad brush paper, as he rightly pointed out, 
I think there are some underlying dilemmas. So I wouldn't necessarily characterize this as a liberal left shift in Europe. I think there are some trade-offs here. And also what I would argue is that a lot of the debate about migration in Europe is focused on what are called, well, what here is referred to sometimes as the movable middle. People who hey, have concern about migration, but aren't necessarily opposed to migration. Uh, and many of those people have more conservative value orientations. So one of the things we've been working on is communication about migration. So I've been working with various organizations, think about how to communicate on migration to people who perhaps do not have left progressive views on migration, are more conservative, and how you can appeal to them. They're not necessarily opposed to migration, but aren't necessarily receptive to left liberal progressive messages on migration. Uh, and that, I think what Chris has hit upon here are some uh, really tough issues in, in European migration politics. There are a lot of trade-offs, I think, and uh, in uh, evident, even though attitudes become more favourable, I think that, 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 that there are some complex trade-offs. And also, I think that many of the people who are uh, persuadable on migration are actually more conservative with a small c. So I'm really interested to explore some of your work on this and to have a look at some of the papers you've written to see, to learn from your research on that. And, and I think the final of the point, effects on policy. Uh, well, that was something we looked at very recently and we published this special issue of the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies where what we were looking at was over, over time, the kind of what we would see as the mainstreaming of radical right ideas into European migration policy. And I won't go into all of the details of, uh, of what that means, but I think it's led to a very strong focus on external border control and significantly reduced channels for regular access by regular migrants to Europe. So I think you know, that you know, may be indica indicative of some of the countervailing tendencies where attitudes to migration are seemingly becoming more favorable, pointing perhaps in more liberal directions, but policy has not been heading in that direction, has become more restrictive. But thanks for those really fantastic comments and I'm really looking forward to catching up with the work you've done as well. That's terrific. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, so uh, now I'd like to open it up to questions and answers. And to get started, I'd like to ask my two co-organizers if they have any questions. So I think um, Catherine, uh, Kleppinger has uh, something she would like to ask in response. Thank you. I see I'm unmuted now. You, everyone can hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm coming at this um, from the French program, so I suppose this is low-hanging fruit. Um, but for both of you, actually, since I've been spending a lot of time looking at politics in France in preparation for the upcoming elections in 2022. And so not necessarily just limited to France, but what I was thinking about is how do you see the impact of kind of specific moments like these elections that validate certain beliefs and messaging? How does that impact a longer term trajectory? I mean, I'm very encouraged by a lot of the conclusions that you're drawing here in a kind of longer term. But I guess what worries me is kind of how do we understand a moment like Marine Le Pen having a national stage to define certain issues and trends that could have kind of a deeply long term impact on on the discourse. Should I respond immediately? Yes, please, please. Either of you, but certainly you, Andrew. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. No, no. Uh, a great, a really great question. It's, uh, I mean, you're, you're more of an expert on France uh, than I am, uh, but I think if we look comparatively, these, these moments as you refer to them, which I suppose are a bit more than a moment now, we're talking about maybe 15, 20 years of recent European political history, uh, I think have brought radical right parties much more into the European mainstream. France, Italy, uh, Austria, we've had radical right parties in government. That's not even talking about the experience in Hungary uh, and, and, and countries in Central and Eastern Europe. So I think what we've seen is uh, parties that were outsiders uh, who, who've become, well, some of them have become insiders 
but also I think some of the, the, their ideas have become more uh, have, have become much more mainstream. So I, mean, I think the co-option of the uh, of uh, the ideas the, the, the co-option of the immigration issue by Sarkozy and now also by Macron uh, in attempts to try maybe to maybe neutralise the appeal of uh, Le Pen on migration, but that happens in other countries as well. So it's a it's a it's a really great point and goes back to this issue about the countervailing tendencies. So attitudes to migration might be coming more favourable in general terms, but the very specific effects of the, you know, the, the effects of salience on governing coalitions can be very powerful uh, and have very powerful effects on the direction of policy, which may not conform with trends in attitudes. And also, I know from my own experience, where we, we spend a lot of time here at EUI talking to people who are engaged in policy making. The common assumption they have that European that there is a kind of underlying hostility or opposition to immigration in Europe, and even when we present this kind of data, as we have done on many occasions, uh, people will say, "Well, that's not my experience." When I talk to people, that's not what they tell me. Uh, so that kind of almost it seems to encounter some kind of cognitive dissonance when uh, you present this kind of data. But it's a, a great point. To follow on that, there's a there is a question here in the chat about um, trying to you know I, it's not response bias but it's it's on um, people basically lying to survey researchers because you know um, presenting oneself as anti-immigrant is sort of not PC and so to please the to please the survey researcher or maybe not even wanting to admit to yourself your biases you you lie so. Uh, this is a question in the chat from Iris Strauss. Uh, so, so, that's a great, it's an interesting point. I, I think the survey questions that we're looking at are often phrased, you know, when we're asking, when you're asking people to identify what they might see as the most important political issues facing their country, you know, health, the economy, immigration, uh, they could identify immigration. That doesn't necessarily mean they're uh, uh, deeply hostile to immigration immigrants. Uh, so I think they're, they're not, you know, they, I don't think the surveys are necessarily asking them or tapping into things that they may find, opinions they may find embarrassing to express. Uh, and I think what, so, you know, but I think, you know, it, it, it is, a, I suppose, a good point about the gathering of, of, of any survey data. But what, what we're referring to or using here are uh, a survey data which have been systematically gathered for long periods of time. I think these kind of issues might be more you know, in some of the kind of opinion polls, there might be maybe more instability. I suppose what we try to use is long-term survey data, Eurobarometer, European Social Survey, European Values Survey, where data is gathered over quite relatively long periods of time, which I think give us a fairly good idea, you know, a fairly good idea about uh, some of the trends. There's, a, there's another question from Henry Manning that suggests that um, COVID-19 might provide right-wing parties um, a more, to, a darker um, message to try to convey in order to attract nativist sentiment. So trying for, trying for example, to associate um, the spread of the virus with migrants and I don't know, uh, I mean, I could see Salvini doing that. Um, I, I'm wondering to what extent um, you're seeing in um, far right or partisan discourse, uh, this kind of attempt to, to smear immigrants with uh, the spread of COVID and the like. Uh, I think I... at the start of the pandemic, Oh, sorry, the talk across you there, sorry. That's fine, Go I missed ahead. that. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's a, a great point from Henry. I think there was some attempt because to link uh, the vaccine to travel uh, and to stigmatise migrants. And so, uh, particularly, I suppose, I can talk about Italy because that's the case I know best at the moment. Uh, and so one of the issues has been boat arrivals, which are on a much smaller level. We might be familiar with these images of boats traveling across the Mediterranean to Italian islands like Lampedusa, which is close to the coast of Libya. Uh, and the, the fear that these boat arrivals would be sources of COVID. Now, what actually happened in Italy was the main source of COVID in Italy, the main kind of vector for transmission of the virus was not immigration. 
it was actually the rich and prosperous north of Italy. The, vac the real hot spot of the COVID uh, pandemic here in Italy was, was the area around the city of Milan, the richest area of Italy. Uh, and so I think that the, you know, the, it actually did rather change the dynamics because the rich and privileged inhabitants of the northern cities of Italy suddenly found themselves under restriction because they were the prime vector for transmission of the, of, of the virus. But now it has certainly it was an undercurrent, I think, of hostility to migrations, potential transmitters of disease is a long-standing uh, component of anti-immigration uh, rhetoric. Uh, but I wonder if, and this is speculating about the future a little bit, I think one of the issues that is likely to become relevant in relation to Henry's point is vaccine inequality. So here, some of us, uh, some people have had access to the vaccine, small numbers, I think, compared to you in the United States. Uh, but of course, in the future, it may very well be the inhabitants of uh, richer countries are, are more likely to have the vaccine and those of poorer countries have not. And they're therefore seen as potential threats in terms of the transmission of the virus or new variants of the virus. Uh, so, I mean, that's speculating a little bit, but I think vaccine inequalities could be an important trend given the slow rollout into the developing world. Right. Well, we've heard in the United States a lot of praise for essential workers, and there have been attempts to prioritize uh, vaccine distribution for essential workers. I haven't heard much, and certainly not for raising their minimum wage, God forbid, but um, they, I, I haven't heard much in Europe about this. The last time I really heard anything much about uh, COVID among migrants was with the asparagus pickers who were flown in special uh, in spite of the border controls in order to pick spargel in the asparagus fields uh, breaks among those farm workers. And we've had similar kinds of outbreaks among migrant farm workers in the United States because they're living in unhygienic and congregate facilities. And I was wondering if if you have any of that uh, kind of, uh, you know, association of outbreaks with migrants? Uh, I think there have been across, uh, yeah, I, I think similarly, because obviously migrants don't, we have the idea that migrants move to countries, but actually they move to very specific localities and into very specific kinds of employment. So migration is actually highly specific. So we might talk about migration into a particular country, but it's often into a neighborhood and into a particular type of employment. And often those types of employment are areas where regulation and you know, basic elements of regulation can be absent. You know, here in, in Italy, there's a very powerful informal economy. Uh, and people work and, and uh, might differ in other European countries, but uh, but I think it is there have been outbreaks. I can I remember there are outbreaks in Germany linked to meat processing, where migrant workers are involved in the, the in food production as they often are across Europe, and similarly also in Italy. But I, I, I think that all that, I think what that actually had the effect of doing is activating the debate about food safety rather than. Uh, necessarily you know, anti-immigration because uh, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a certainly a strong realization of the essential work done by migrants, which doesn't always, I don't think then simply easily trans, you know, it, that what that then means for longer term policy responses seems to me to be still a bit up in the air. Whether, you know, that, whether the abuse of migrant workers. Um. Okay, uh, apparently uh, there's been an objection to my paraphrasing the questions in the chat. So let me ask Elizabeth Chaco if she would uh, like to unmute and ask her question. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, welcome. Um, so my, thank you. My question is pretty simple. I really liked the funnel of causality of attitudes to immigration because it was clearly explained there was age, there were different factors as one progressed along, you know, the life journey. But I wondered how you came about it. it is, is it based on surveys that were done in Europe? Well, is it a combination of countrywide surveys? Um, was it based on independent studies? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, th thanks, Elizabeth. Well, it's it's an attempt to, uh, I mean, it's a great question. It's an attempt to just apply more general insights and factors that shape attitudes to social and political issues generally to immigration. So I think the best way to define it would be as a, a heuristic. So, uh, and as a way to try to make sense of when you interpret data on attitudes to immigration. Uh, so what, uh, what our basic contention will be that attitudes to immigration are formed in a way as attitudes to a similar way to other social and political issues, not particularly uh, there's no reason to think that they will be formed in different ways, but they're likely to be influenced by these fundamental factors that we identify on the left-hand side of, of what we call, uh, what, what could we call this funnel of causality. And what we were also particularly keen to emphasise was that media effects, which are often seen as really important, are actually much, you know, less, uh, are, are more likely to be impactful in the way that they trigger existing sentiments linked to people's personality and their experience of education, those kind of things. So uh, we developed it as, as a service, as, a, as, a, as, a, well, as, an, as an application from the more general social scientific literature on how attitudes are formed to apply it to migration. And, and I suppose just as a, as a side note, uh, that you know, it, it, it was, to also perhaps to try and have an influence on some of the policy debate here in, in Europe, where it's often seen to be assumed that attitudes to migration are formed differently or are differently structured, different factors influence them. So, uh, you know, it's a temporary really just to bring to bear maybe a more general science, social science perspective on that. Uh, I hope that helps. Great, that's terrific. Um, are there any other questions out there? Mr. Strauss, would you like to ask your question directly? Okay, so um, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, thank the two speakers for their contributions today and to um, hope, I, I once again remind everybody we have our next event on March 24th at 10 o'clock on France and the Mediterranean and on April 23rd on approaches to migration in Southern and Eastern Europe. So I hope that you'll join us for those. And um, once again, I, please join me. I don't know how to clap except virtually, but please join me in thanking Andrew and Chris for some really terrific um, information today for great presentations. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, Hilary. Thanks, all, everybody, for coming. And thanks also to Chris for the really uh, great comments. Thanks. Really enjoyed it.